This video is sponsored by Brilliant, but more on them at the end of the video. Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I've got this Dell Vostro desktop computer that I bought on eBay as four parts or not working. Apparently, this shouldn't turn on, so we're going to be looking at what's gone wrong with this machine and hopefully we'll fix it. If you're wondering about the exact model of this machine, it's the Dell Vostro 3471, which isn't the friendliest number to say over and over again, so I'm just naming it the Vostro for this video. This computer supposedly has an Intel Core i3-9100 CPU in it, as well as 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD. So pretty solid specs for a personal computer if you're not doing any super intense tasks. But hopefully this computer does actually have these specs in it because I have had some experiences where eBay sellers have been flaky with providing properly specced systems. But back to the task at hand, the first step with a broken computer such as this one is of course to attempt to recreate the issue yourself. So I got a keyboard, mouse, and monitor plugged into the PC and then attempted to power it on. As would be expected based on the listing description though, when I pressed the power button, there were absolutely no signs of life emitted from the PC. I didn't hear or see a single fan spin. There wasn't a flash or anything from the power button LED or any other LED for that matter. And I didn't hear any electrical whines from the power delivery circuits on the motherboard or in the power supply. So yeah, it seems like this system is completely dead. Now, if you're a bit newer to PC troubleshooting and haven't been around many systems that have failed in this mode, you might be inclined to think that this is a really bad failure and could possibly even spell doom for the computer entirely. However, this exact failure mode is, in my opinion, a really good looking one. Generally, a system that shows no signs of life whatsoever is doing so because of some issues with the power supply. Whether that's a dead power supply or just an unplugged power supply cable obviously has to be found out with further troubleshooting, but in a case where there's absolutely no power up, I like to start with the power supply. Now, one thing that I did notice with this system when recreating the issue is that when I plugged the power supply into power, the green self-test LED on these Dell PSUs wasn't illuminated at all. This power supply is of the newer kind where there isn't a button you have to press to run the self-test and see the LED light up. So if the unit is good, the LED should be illuminated. This was another immediate tip off to me that the power supply was at fault here. But with my suspicions of the power supply high, I started to dismantle the computer to check out some other obvious things like the memory and power supply cables, both of which were fine. While inside the system, I also checked that the RAM and SSD included matched up with what I should have been sent, but I saw that as I foreshadowed earlier, the RAM and SSD were both of much smaller capacities than I was promised in the listing. Lovely. Instead of 16 gigabytes of RAM, I actually had a single four gigabyte stick, and instead of a 512 gigabyte SSD, I was given a 128 gigabyte M.2 SATA drive. So yeah. I ended up getting a bit ripped off there, but oh well. Thankfully, I make YouTube videos on these systems to show my process for fixing them, and that means that I have a bit of a financial safety net, even if I get partly scammed. But moving on from that, I tried two more things before I pulled out the power supply and ran it through some tests to determine if it had failed or not. Firstly, I pulled the CMOS battery out of the motherboard and gave it a test with my CMOS battery tester, link to the video on how I built this tool in the description if you like it, and the battery measured good. Plus, the act of pulling it out and putting it back in should have reset the CMOS as well. Even after all of that though, there was still no dice on the power up. The other thing that I tried was actually not something to do with the broken computer itself, but instead it pertained to my testing setup. I always make sure that all of the cables in my test setup are functional so as not to throw myself off when testing computers, but maybe there's a chance that something went wrong with my test cable recently. So I plugged another PC into that cable and pressed the power button. The PC booted up just fine though, so I know that this power cable is not a problem, which was to be expected, but always make sure that the simple things aren't gonna throw you off when you're troubleshooting like this. With all of those steps out of the way, I pulled the power supply out of the computer and ran some tests on it. Usually at this point, if I had a known good power supply on hand, I'd actually just swap that into the system and see if it booted up, and that would determine if the power supply was the issue, but in this case, 
I didn't have a replacement on hand. The only test power supply for Dell computers that I have on hand is one of the older ones that uses Dell's 8-pin motherboard connector and not this new 6-pin type. Plus, my DIY power supply tester doesn't support this type of Dell power supply, so we're gonna have to go the old-fashioned way and use a multimeter. So, I plugged the power supply into power and took my multimeter set to DC volts and measured some of the power rails on it. This power supply is a little bit unconventional in that it has a standby mode and an on mode, which is different from most PC power supplies, which have their main power rails, which are off until the power supply is triggered to turn on, and then they have a separate wire which supplies standby power even when the power supply is off which is usually about 5 volts at 3 amps. This supply just has its main power rails, which supply 12 volts at a couple of amps in standby mode, and then their full current capacity when the unit is triggered to be on, but all the while it uses the same wires. So this means that I can just measure if there's standby voltage on any of these power rails, which there should be, by just measuring the 12 volt motherboard rail, even without triggering the unit to turn on. After measuring the 12 volt motherboard rail and also the CPU rail for good measure, both came back with zero volts, which is not good. For good measure though, I still used a jumper wire across the green power supply on wire and a black ground wire to trigger the unit to power up. And while measuring the voltages with this jumper in place, I was still greeted with no voltage on the output. This power supply is completely fried. Well, we know that this computer is either going to need a new power supply or a repair on its current power supply. So yay, troubleshooting is complete. But before I move on from talking about the troubleshooting altogether, I would like to throw in a little bit of information that I have that I think you might find interesting or useful. And this information came into play when I was troubleshooting this power supply. Usually when plugging a computer into wall power, a small pop or click can be heard from the power supply's power jack when you plug the cable in. This is a small spark inside the connector, which occurs when power is applied and a bunch of current flows to charge up the power supply's main capacitor. When plugging this power supply into the wall, I never heard this noise. Combining that information with the fact that there was no voltage on the output of the power supply, I think it's pretty likely that the fuse inside this power supply is blown. Considering that there's clearly no power flowing into the power supply when I plug it in, it would make sense for the fuse to be blown because the fuse is usually the first thing that the mains power runs through when it comes into the power supply. That's because the fuse can only protect what's downstream of it, hence it would be stupid to put much circuitry upstream of the fuse as the fuse would be incapable of protecting that circuitry in the event of a fault. Moving on though, let's take a closer look at this power supply. Now, I like to mess with and build circuits and know enough about mains voltage to know how to be safe around it. So for the sake of providing some knowledge and entertainment, as well as trying to perform a board level repair on this power supply for my own curiosity, I'm going to open it up and have a poke around to see if I can figure out what might've gone wrong. Of course, opening power supplies is dangerous. And if you don't know what you're doing, I strongly recommend that you steer clear of trying this. As we'll learn soon, a replacement for one of these units is not expensive and it's not worth risking your health or safety over. If you decide to try this, be careful and assume all risks and responsibility yourself. Inside the power supply, the first thing that I did was ensure that the high voltage capacitor was fully discharged, which it was, and now I could safely handle the board. I checked the fuse with continuity mode on my multimeter, and sure enough, it was blown wide open. Now the important thing to remember when troubleshooting like this is that when you run across a blown fuse, more times than not, the fuse is the symptom and not the illness itself. They can occasionally blow on a one-off power surge, but it's more likely that something downstream of it failed short and the fuse blew because of that. So being a non-expert on troubleshooting switch mode power supplies, such as this one, I started checking for shorts and failures in the only place I really knew to start at, the main power transistors. In these modern power supplies, these transistors are almost always MOSFETs, and so I checked the main power MOSFETs to check that they were in working order. And that's when I found that one of the MOSFETs in charge of high voltage switching in this power supply had failed completely short, almost certainly explaining that blown fuse. The way that this MOSFET had blown, which was so that all three of its pins, the gate, drain, and source were all conducting to each other, was also a really bad way for it to fail in terms of the repairability for this power supply. The fact that the drain and source had not only shorted to each other, but had also shorted to the gate, means it's likely high voltage had been connected directly to the MOSFET's driving circuitry at some point, 
possibly damaging it. If the MOSFET's driver circuitry was damaged, I was going to have practically no hope of fixing this power supply with both my skill level and possible replacement part availability. And this discovery stopped me in my tracks with my hopes of repairing the power supply. I did have a look online to see if a replacement MOSFET would be cheap, because if so, I probably would have gone and bought one, soldered it in, and given it a shot for the sake of my own curiosity. However, I couldn't find an exact replacement for this FET anywhere, and a suitable substitute would have cost about $15 after shipping, when a new power supply costs $18 shipped. So this is where the attempt at maybe doing a board level repair on this power supply ends. And I defeatedly placed an order for a new power supply. While I waited for that to arrive though, I took my time to repaste the system, which also allowed me to verify that I did, in fact, have a Core i3-9100 installed. Then, once the new power supply arrived, I installed it and the system booted right up as it should. With an upgraded 8GB of RAM and a failed attempt at using a PCI Express SSD in the M.2 slot, which happens to be SATA only, I installed Windows 11 and ran Cinebench to ensure the system's stability and temperatures. In the end, I probably paid way too much for the system with a 9100, 8 gigs of RAM, and a 128 gigabyte SATA SSD, but I'll sell it for really cheap to someone who just needs a computer to turn in Google Docs and slides for schoolwork or something, as it will at least be better than a Chromebook for that. Now, I could end the video here and get onto the sponsored message, which I think you'll actually really like, so do stick around for that, but I have a bit more to add on the failed power supply first, which I discovered later when messing with it. I've mentioned that I'm an electronics hobbyist, and this means that I tend to pull lots of old components off of broken or old devices to reuse in projects. And this broken power supply board is no different. I stole the film capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, full bridge rectifier, power diodes, MOSFETs, and heat sinks off of it. I tested all of the components after desoldering to weed out any failed ones, such as the MOSFET which I had identified as failed earlier, but I also ended up discovering another failed part in this process, the main filter capacitor. This capacitor was starting to leak out a bit around one of its legs, so I was already going to discard it once I saw that, but I chose to measure it anyway, and when I measured it, it measured terribly. This is not supposed to be a 13 nanofarad capacitor, not even close. I retested it a few times, and I also used another meter, and still saw a similar readout. So, interestingly, not only did one of the main MOSFETs fail, but so did the main filter capacitor. I really wonder what happened to this power supply, and I'm glad I didn't waste my money on buying that new FET because it definitely wouldn't have fixed the issue. If you enjoy this kind of troubleshooting and work with electronics that you've seen a bit in this video, before we go, I would like to tell you about one more thing, and that is today's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online interactive learning platform that's a super powerful tool for learning problem solving skills in an accessible way. A while ago, I worked through Brilliant's digital circuits course, and what I absolutely loved about that course was how the information was presented in small bits that were quizzed immediately after. And the quizzes weren't memorization based, rather they had me solve real problems with what I had just learned. And this method of learning really helped me cement the concepts into my brain in a way that I'd remember them and be able to use them in the future. In fact, after that course, I used those concepts to design a circuit for a whole 8-bit calculator made out of just NAND gates. Brilliant also has a regular circuits course, which you might find interesting, along with a ton of other courses surrounding math, science, data analysis, and computer science topics, all of which are presented in this great format. If you're looking to expand your skill sets in meaningful ways, check out everything Brilliant has to offer at brilliant.org forward slash chwtt, or you can use the QR code on screen or the link in the video description as well. Plus, you'll get an extra 20% off of an annual premium subscription. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Well, that's all that I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.